We have superior technology and firepower. Impenetrable defenses. The mistake would be not to act. Today I'm going to be using the Church of Jeff to show off some interesting mechanics that I think sometimes get overlooked. That of course is pre-contact wars and everything we can do with them. I'm also going to go through corvette design at this very early stage of the game where we have no new technologies researched. So the first step as an interplanetary species will be to send your science ship out to do some surveying. Surveying and exploration. But as you explore, you may discover that you are not the only sapient life form out there in the universe. Now to take advantage of pre-contact wars, you must choose the aggressive contact policy, meaning you must select the bottom option here. If you choose the proactive or the cautious policy, you will not be able to make any aggressive moves towards any unknown alien entities. This is the only option that enables hostile first contact. Now in order to prolong our pre-contact period as much as possible, don't assign any envoys to the first contact. By assigning envoys here, what we will be doing is we'll be pushing first contact through the various stages until we reach full diplomatic relations with this alien nation. Instead, we're going to be using our early game fleet. We're going to be building more ships and we are going to completely eviscerate another power before they even know what has hit them. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Dark Forest. And speaking of the Dark Forest, I'd like to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Clash of Clans. Clash of Clans is a free-to-play mobile game set on a pre-FTL world, where you must pick up the mantle of responsibility and take on the role of Chief of the Village. But your village is not alone in that deep dark forest. No, you're surrounded by many other players who have a goal exactly the same as yours to build up their village using resources gained from attacking other villages with your troops. As a proverbial hunter, you'll be earning rewards, either buying them with medals or producing them in your own village. You can download Clash of Clans right now by following the link down in the description below. It is essential that you find their capital as soon as possible. You'll know it's their capital because it will have a very large population, at least over 28, lots of workers, an upgraded starbase, and very likely also three ships. Now, until we actually engage these aliens, for now, they are completely neutral. This may be slightly different if you come up against an alien race that is hostile. We can also use this opportunity to scope out the various weapons our opponent has. Now at this point in the game, no one has researched any advanced technologies, everyone has the base technologies. So by looking at what the graphical representation of the ship is, we can know almost for certain what type of weapons they have. And the important weapons to take note of here are whether they have missiles. This is a missile component. You can see it looks like it's got some uh, some missile bays in it. And then they've also got what could be kinetic or laser weaponry. Now you will not be able to tell the difference between kinetic and laser weaponry, but that doesn't matter. As I mentioned, the only things we're really looking for is whether we have laser or kinetic weapons, whether the enemy has point defense weapons like this one, or whether they are completely loaded up on missiles. Each different ship type, be they necroid like these or reptilian or mammalian, has slight variations in the way their weapons look. So in order for this to really work, you will have to learn all of them, but don't worry, the main things to look out for here are, do they have missile bays or not? If you don't see missiles, then that makes our life much, much easier. Speaking of ships and how they look, let's look at our ship designs. Now, the king of pre-contact warfare is this missile class interceptor corvette. There are some caveats that I'll get to in a moment, but basically missiles are the strongest weapon right at the start of the game. They have massive range, meaning they will be engaging first. They completely ignore shields. So if you only are running missiles, you do not have to worry about any shields on your opponent's ships whatsoever. They also have reasonably all right tracking and 100% accuracy. So a fleet equipped with just these missile class corvettes will wipe out any other fleet type, unless the fleet has point defense. 
Point defense on ships is now good enough that a single ship with point defense can completely negate, and this is only a single point of point defense here, all three incoming missiles from the enemy ship. That then means if you come up against a fleet of ships only wielding missiles, you'll want to respec your ship so that you have point defense and missiles as well. You're starting to see we're getting a bit of a tic-tac-toe here. Now, what happens next? Well, this ship designed with point defense, if it comes up against missiles, will take a hilariously low amount of damage, basically zero unless you get some unfortunate misses, and it will wipe the floor with the other missile class corvettes. But there is a problem. If two fleets with missile point defense come up against each other, you end up with two fleets sitting there and doing absolutely nothing for basically decades. And that leads us to the design where we're actually going back to basics here and we're swapping out the missiles for mass drivers and red lasers. Now, if you're coming up against predominantly star bases and you know you outclass the enemy fleet anyway, if they have only missiles, for example, you could run just red lasers. Lasers are now much more powerful than kinetics in the early game. They deal additional damage to armor and hull and star bases are mainly comprised of armor and hull. So this ship type with point defense and kinetics with lasers is going to do really well against enemy missile ships and enemy point defense missile class corvettes because they won't be doing any damage whatsoever. That does, however, bring us to the final class here in the tic-tac-toe of pre-contact warfare, and that's the gunship class. A gunship class ship will outperform a point defense gunship ship because the gunship class will be able to deal more damage output because the point defense really isn't good at shooting individual ships. However, if your opponent then ends up running gunship classes, you should switch back into missiles. There is a lovely tic-tac-toe here. PD missile beats missile, PD gunship beats PD missile, gunship beats PD gunship, and finally, as ever, missile beats gunship. You'll probably want to have at least a couple of point defense ships out there as well, just to ward off the occasional missile from the low level star bases. Low level star bases do usually come with a single missile, so it can be nice to take absolutely no damage when dealing with those outer star bases that have not been upgraded. So we found our enemy's capital here, and we've also found another system where they're beginning to form a colony. What we can do now is basically preemptively prevent any expansion from this alien empire. The main benefits from pre-contact warfare are that you can completely hamper an empire before they even have a chance to do anything. They have a single planet here where they are beginning to colonize it. If we are to fly in and take up hostile positions over that colony and bombard it, well, first we'll have to deal with this hostile station. Give that a moment. And if you're enjoying this video, please start a first contact war with that like button. While we're dealing with the station, I should probably mention that it is a brilliant idea at the start of the game if you're going for this pre-contact warfare rush to build up your alloy industry. Don't worry about your research too much. Yes, it is going to fall behind, but there will be a prize, a jewel at the end of this that will more than make up for it in the long run. I promise you. Now that we're bombarding a colonizing planet, what you'll notice is slowly but surely the colony progress will tick backwards until we eventually completely annihilate it. Once you've dealt with that colony world, reduced it to rubble, and you've left them only with their home planet, but before you are completely certain your navy outclasses their navy, as you can see, their starbase plus ships together do have quite a bit more fleet power than me, we can go about hurting their economy. To do that, what we're going to do is going to target their mining and research stations above the various deposits. We can completely destroy these hurting their economy severely. This will take away research, it will take away energy and minerals. And given we've got a massive fleet, there's basically nothing they can do about this. And now we are going to engage the enemy. We're going to knock out their ships first and then deal with the starbase. The starbase may end up being something of a tough nut to crack. Something I would recommend you do is you always keep one ship in the system that you're attacking in their capital system without engaging it in the conflict. That way, if worst case happens, you can retreat your main navy, repair it, come back and attack later. But this starbase will not have begun repairing. 
whilst you still have one ship in the system, the enemy starbase cannot for 30 days begin repairing. Don't forget to start building up an assault army while these space attacks are underway. You'll probably need somewhere in the region of 150 to 200 worth of strength. In this case, they're 75, but I'm almost certain they're going to build more assault units. Of course, who these people are, I have absolutely no idea. Yes, these definitely aren't any sentient life forms at all. Right, the star base is down. Now I'm going to begin by bombarding the planet. The main purpose of this bombardment is to prevent them building additional assault armies and reduce the garrison there. You could go to an indiscriminate bombardment, but that might kill Pops. And we really don't want to kill Pops wherever possible, so I'd recommend we stick at the moment to selective stance. We've now brought up an assault force, and we're going to show these primitives that they really picked the wrong aliens to live near. What you're going to see is something rather remarkable. So. When we finally invade another planet in a pre-contact war, we will actually get communications. We'll get full communications and full diplomacy with them. However, something else will happen that is rather magical. But what do you think about pre-contact warfare? Is it a powerful tool or is it only really there for roleplay? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And now, as their final armies die and we take control of the planet, something strange has happened. We now have diplomatic relations with the Democratic Republic of Skraken. We've encountered our first aliens. We've invaded Skraken and the Democratic Republic of Skraken has been destroyed. Yes, when you invade a, in a pre-contact war an alien planet, they lose complete ownership of that planet. It becomes uncolonized. We still have all of the pops on the planet though. You'll notice we have rulers, we have unemployed specialists, and we have kind of broken unemployed workers. We have all of the districts, we even have prosperous unification still firing on this world. What we can do now is we can build a starbase and outpost around this system, send a colony ship over. Once our colony ship arrives, lands on the planet and begins the colonization process as we've just done, you'll see that interestingly, all of those pops suddenly become employed and they start contributing resources and cost upkeep for our entire empire. Yes, this means the number of pops in our empire has jumped. Before year 10, we're at 69 pops. Oh my goodness me, it's sexy. I believe this means you can have faster pop growth than even a clone army origin empire. And once the colonization process is complete, all of these lovely, lovely pops will not be getting any negative happiness modifiers due to being conquered because we didn't conquer them. We simply found them on a planet randomly out there in the universe. Oh, what luck. The only downsides from any of this is that you might start losing that pre-contact or first contact war and have to rush your envoy in to complete the diplomatic process to begin contact. When you do that, you won't be at war anymore. You'll only have probably a minus 75 relations modifier, which is something you can almost certainly overcome with a lot of happy envoys if they turn out to be a rather powerful neighbor who you probably shouldn't have upset so much. Now you know everything pretty much there is to know about pre-contact war and how you can use it to devastating effect. Go out there, have fun, and kill the galaxy. Jeff wills it. If you've enjoyed this video on early Corvette design and pre-contact warfare, and you'd like to find out 11 tips to help you min-max your empire, click the video on screen now.